Hello, greetings. It is good to have you join with me in this Bible study. Uh, I want to say at the outset, this week will be just a little bit different. It has been our custom over the last several weeks to take the text of God's Word, put it on the screen, walk through it in a way similar to what we typically do as a church family on Wednesday nights in our Bible study together. Uh, I've been having a little bit of technological difficulties. I don't think it's my fault, but it might be. Um, I've been cutting in and out, having the reception cut in and out. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to be a little bit old school. I will have my text before me. You will have your text before you, Lord willing. We will walk through it together. I'll pull a few things out, but the text won't be on the screen. I'm sorry. So maybe we'll get back to that next week, Lord willing. But it is what it is, so we're going to move on. Uh, as is the saying, the show must go on, or something like that. Several weeks ago, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. The week after that, Luke 11, 1 through 4. Then Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, then 5 through 8. And today, we're going to look at Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. So please, if you haven't done so already, get, you out, get out your own copy of God's Word, the Bible physically lay it open before you, maybe have a notepad next to you, something, and we will study God's Word together for our brief time together right now. Um, my, my firm conviction that kind of set me going on these particular studies is that we as believers, I, don't intuitively automatically know how to pray and how to pray well, and that's not just for when I'm praying by myself, but also when I'm praying with other believers. And I believe firmly that we ought to grow in praying and praying together, not just for one another, but with one another. And so we've looked at these texts specifically with the focus on prayer and in particular, the angle on corporate prayer. So we haven't pulled everything out that are in, that are, that's in these texts. Uh, we certainly haven't drawn out all the implications that one could, we've just hit a few highlights along the way. And I hope that you have been blessed and encouraged and certainly are making progress in growing. And, and don't just leave these to the side. Uh, choose intentionally to pick up what you're learning and apply them very practically in your context of praying within your church family, with, with our church family, Anchor Baptist Church. So without further ado, uh, take out your text. We're going to read it pray, make some observations, and then, Lord willing, draw some applications, some implications, conclusions, and then close in prayer. So here is the text, verse 39, Luke chapter 22. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. Just a side note, it's a very interesting phrase. We're not going to pull out everything from that, but just note that. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Father, as we look to your word for just a brief few moments here, I pray that you would give us attentiveness to the word, minimize the distractions of our surroundings and our mind and our heart, and help us, Lord, to have ears that are ready to hear. Help us to see and to be careful and understand. And Lord, even where you do bring conviction and even understanding, you would give us a readiness and a diligence to pick up and apply to our lives. I pray, Lord, that we would grow and you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So just a few observations. Uh, more contextually, the surrounding context of this passage and even beyond to the parallel gospel accounts before we get going, this Scene is recounted by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not by John. Uh, further, Matthew and Mark specify 
kind of a differentiation between the disciples and then Peter, James, and John, and then Jesus. Luke does not, in this particular passage, make such a distinction, just disciples and Jesus. Further, Matthew and Mark include what probably is that famous line found in Matthew and Mark's rendition of this, and that is, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. A great line that has become something of a proverb for probably many people. Luke does not include that particular phrase, but Luke does seem to draw out a bit stronger emphasis on prayer. And by that, not just Jesus praying, but especially his disciples, Jesus' encouragement to them to pray. So let's look at the text. Look at verse 39 in your own copy of God's word. And I will look at mine and try to walk us through the text briefly. So notice in verse 39, he went out, he came out and went. So that is, that is Jesus. He came out and went. The place that he is going to is the Mount of Olives, located near Jerusalem outside the city. And notice what Luke says, as was his custom. So this was Jesus' practice. You can even think about what's going on in the text. And I think probably any and really all of these are true. What was his custom? Um, going out to pray. Um, going out at times to a, a, a secluded or an isolated place to pray. And taking his disciples with him and encouraging them, modeling for them what it meant to be him, to follow after him. So remember, a disciple is a follower. A disciple is one who is seeking to learn everything they can from the master, from the rabbi, from the teacher, with the desired purpose of becoming like them. So following them literally, learning from them, teaching, and trying to imitate even their example. And what we see going on in this text is, is really um, Jesus' example to his disciples. Yes, it's more than that, but it's Jesus' example to his disciples. Look at verse 40. And he came to that place, that place was the Mount of Olives, and he said to them, there's this teaching, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now just ponder that. You could pause, either literally or just think about this. What is Jesus getting at? Pray that you may not enter into temptation. I think Jesus could be getting at a couple of different basic ideas, uh, one or the other, or maybe even both. Uh, the first might be that Jesus is telling his disciples what to pray for. We could think of this in terms of a request. Father, please do not lead me into temptation. Please help me avoid temptation. Father, this is my asking, my request to you. Keep me from temptation. Now, if that sounds familiar, it's because it is. Luke chapter 4, or excuse me, Luke chapter 11, verse 4 Jesus' model prayer to his disciples includes that very thing. Pray to the Father that he would keep you, not lead you into temptation. But I think possibly, and maybe even um, of greater substance in this particular text, is Jesus possibly saying not just a request to pray for, but what if the act of prayer itself is a means, is a strategy of fighting temptation? whatever that temptation may be, and we're not going to go down that route too far, but whatever that is, what if Jesus is by his teaching and his, his example in what he will be doing, what if he's getting at that certainly we should pray as a request to avoid temptation, but what if the act of prayer actually doing it, almost to some degree, regardless what we pray, if we're truly seeking communion with the Father, seeking his help, seeking his direction, depending upon him as an expression of faith? What if that is in and of itself a strategy to avoid temptation? I think that's included in this text. So as you keep going on, after he encouraged them, which by the way, uh, this is another example of the corporate element of prayer, meaning that it's not just you and God. Uh, we see in Jesus' life and ministry and even beyond in the New Testament, that prayer is something between me and God, but also as a disciple with other disciples. It is something we engage in together. That's why I say corporate prayer. It's not one or the other. It's both. Me praying myself to God, 
and me praying with other believers. And you see that when Jesus gives this command to pray. In our English versions, it doesn't come out as clearly because we don't see as clearly the differentiation between singular and plural. But in the original language, the word pray is a command here in verse 40, and it's plural. You, plural, pray. So this is not something separate, but they do together. Verse 41, and then he withdrew from there, from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. So he goes some distance. I don't know if it was 10, 15 yards, something like that. He goes off on his own and he prays while he keeps them there. And he says, you guys pray. You pray together. And we're not going to look with great detail at his prayer, but just notice a few things about his prayer. Father, so is this not how Jesus encouraged his disciples to pray? You address him as father. That's what Jesus does. And we imitate him as well. He has made that possible for us to have access to God. And he has given us the right to be called children of God. So we call out father. That's what Jesus does. Father, if you are re willing, remove this cup from me. Never the, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is profound. And again, regrettably, we're not going to cover all the bases of what's going on in Jesus' prayer. But you understand, if you understand a little bit about the context and what's going on, Jesus knows this moment in his life. He knows he is about to be betrayed. He knows this is the night before he will be crucified. He knows he has been and is on a path of suffering, great anguish. He knows what's coming. And so he is filled with grief. He is filled with emotional distress. And notice what he does with all of that. He wrestles with it, yes, but he goes to his father in prayer. He goes to his father in prayer. I think, uh, you know, among the many things we could extract from this, do we do that? What do we do when we are emotionally and we are mentally and we are just taxed, filled with distress and grief over a crisis, a tragedy, even something we're going through? Do we go to our Father in prayer? Jesus did. And if you want to put it this way, he engaged God the Father with his trauma, with his, with his distress. We see both the full divinity of Jesus and the full humanity of him. And here, really in stark relief, wrestling in his humanity, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I will, but what you will, Father. So let's keep going on in verse 43. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. So he prayed, he goes to his father with his distress, he, he recognizes that it's his father he needs to rely upon. He's going to, to find strength and great help. And he receives it. And then what does he do after that? He prays all the more. He doesn't give up in prayer. He, he prays earnestly. Now, to use a different word, but the same idea, he is steadfast in prayer. He doesn't give up. So as we keep going on. He prayed earnestly, and so much so that Luke recounts uniquely that he sweat great drops of blood, like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them praying. No, he finds them sleeping. And Luke notes this, that they were sleeping for sorrow. I'm going to draw that out in just a moment. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise. And pray that you may not enter temptation. So Jesus reiterates the same thing he told them before he left them. Right. Pray that you may not enter temptation. So they were found sleeping for sorrow. Now, that's a, an odd way to put it or an odd phrase. What, what does Luke mean that they were sleeping for sorrow? Think about it. I, I don't know if. Luke would have us understand that Jesus is saying, you shouldn't ever sleep. I, I don't think that's what Luke is narrating Jesus is getting at, nor do I think that Jesus is saying, if you ever fall asleep while praying, well, shame on you. You know, who among us has attempted to pray while falling asleep at night and 
we fall asleep. I mean, that's very, very typical, very normal. And I actually think that's one of the most blessed things to do is to pray while trying to drift off to sleep and you end up going to sleep. Uh, but I digress. I, I don't think Jesus is diminishing one or the other of those. However, think with me about this. Do we have a tendency of mistaking what we truly need, maybe especially in a moment of crisis? Ponder that. When you are in a moment of distress, emotional anguish, grief, sorrow, uh, tragedy has befallen you, when you are worked up emotionally, are you thinking straight about what you actually need most in that moment? So just stick with me here for a moment. Further, we also, I think, have a tendency to give ourselves in those moments to that which comes easiest. So let me put it a different way. I think what Jesus is getting at here is that in the moment of emotional distress, in the moment of uncertainty, in the moment of confusion, in moments of great sorrow, what did the disciples give themselves to? They gave themselves to sleep. Jesus had told them, give yourselves to pray and they gave themselves to sleep. Now, Jesus knows our frame. He knows we are weak. He knows that we are but dust. And certainly every single one of us have had those moments when we, all we can do is really put our head on the pillow or on the ground or on the couch and drift off to sleep. But just think about this a little bit. Jesus' encouragement is that when you are sorrowful, when you are going through emotional distress and in trial and trauma, would you think about what you need most? And certainly that's not to say you can't sleep or shouldn't sleep. Yeah, you do need sleep, but would you give yourself to praying to the Father? So let's even take that a little bit further and kind of extract some implications or conclusions even with that. Let, let's, let's say number one is this. Prayer is a means of fighting against temptation. I think what that meant for the disciples, Jesus said, pray that you may not enter into temptation. If, as I understand in this text, Jesus is getting at prayer of itself is a strategy to fight against temptation. What did they do? They didn't pray. They gave up in it. So prayer is a means of fighting hard against temptation. Now, even big picture. The temptation I think that Jesus is getting at is multi-layered and even across time. So what, what sort of temptations were the disciples given to? I think sleeping rather than praying, but also think down the road with what's going to come. Jesus' betrayal in the garden with, with standing beside Jesus, following after him, even when he is being wrongfully accused at the cross itself. What does Peter do? He denies Jesus. And he doesn't just deny Jesus once, but thrice, I had to say that word, three times he denies Jesus. So layers, levels of temptation, temptations to not depend upon the Father, temptations to not do the will of the Father, temptations to not obey him, even in intense pressure, oppression, persecution, great ridicule possibly even your own life. They gave in. They gave up to those temptations. So I think, number one, prayer is a means of fighting against that temptation. Just as a supposal, what if Peter, James, and John, and even the rest of the disciples, diligently labored in prayer as Jesus commanded them to? Is it possible that we would have seen a slightly different, if not radically different, dynamic about them the rest of the night in the garden during Jesus' uh, kangaroo court and then even at the cross? Is it possible? Just as a supposal, I think it's hypothetically possible. It's not what we see, but that's, I think, what could have happened. Further, number two, praying together is a means of helping each other fight temptation. Can, can you imagine uh, if the scene that Luke sets for us is basically 
the 12, well, not the 12, but the 11 disciples gathered together, maybe even more, but at least those 11 gathered together on the Mount of Olives, even if it was just Peter, James, and John. A, a threefold cord is not easily broken, we, we hear in the Old Testament. What if they said, we commit to praying out loud with one another, for one another? There is, there is greater accountability, there is greater strength in fighting hard against temptation. And yet, like any of those stories that include some watchman in the night, if he is watching all by himself in the early morning hours, what often happens, he falls asleep all by himself. But what if he's together? Uh, the one can help the other. And throughout that, there's a great accountability. So praying together is a means of helping each other fight temptation. Let's even add to the mix kind of a third point. It's not entirely parallel with the first two. Thus, you and I need to wrestle together in prayer and not give up. We need to wrestle in prayer together. Not, not just say, hey, I'll pray for you. That's a good thing. Do that. But actually praying with one another. We need to wrestle and engage in prayer together. I think of a, as a New Testament parallel to this is Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. I think a similar sort of idea that we see here in Luke, that Jesus is commanding his disciples, watch and pray. Matthew and Mark both record that same phrase. So we need to wrestle together in prayer and not give up. I think a fourth, uh, fourth implication we can draw from this, again, closely connected to the third, not necessarily par parallel with the first two, is we need to wrestle in prayer together because we know the need of the moment. And, and here, I think, is a part of the nub of the issue. Why didn't the disciples give themselves to prayer and praying together, though Jesus commanded them to? Why didn't they? Certainly, you could say physically they were tired. The other accounts, Matthew and Mark says, their eyes were heavy. You've been there. I've been there. But, but what else was going on? Was other, were other things going on? I think there were other things going on. And this is what I've, I, I propose to you. What if what was going on is they didn't fully grasp the moment. They didn't fully grasp the urgency of, was, of what was before them. They didn't fully embrace the need. What do I really need now? We are inclined, again, our tendency is to mistake what we actually need in the moment. And, and this can be very, very dangerous for us. Do, ask yourself this question. I'm asking you, I'm asking myself, do you actually feel a need to pray with other believers. Do you feel that need? You know, one of, one of the challenges with the last couple of months and weeks, with everything that's going on around our society in the very format of our video here, is, 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 the, is the limitations on praying with one another as has been our custom. Now, I'm not saying we can't go to some great length to try to make that still happen. We have, we've tried, we've appealed, we've encouraged. But do you really feel a need to pray with other believers? Let, let me just even elaborate that a little bit further. How many of us are prone to turn to rest rather than praying together? So let me put it very bluntly. How many of you are prone not to make praying with other believers a priority, right? What do you say instead is a necessity? Now, you might not use that word need, but by your practice, by your function, what do you do? Now, we provide kind of per our schedule of gatherings opportunities to pray together. So at minimum, do you make those times a priority? I am not saying you can't have an excuse. I'm not saying you can't go on vacation. I'm not saying your work schedule has to perfectly line up, but do you as a rule make it a priority? Do you? Do you? We could add more times, but the question is, would you show up? 
right? Would you engage other believers in prayer? H how do you end up turning to rest rather than praying together? A further question, how many of us are prone to think that what we need is rest, not resisting temptation with further elaboration? My praying with other believers is a strategy of resisting temptation. Now, we could go down this trail a lot further than that, but we're going to leave it at that for right now. I, I think Jesus' example is so key. In, in thinking about Jesus' moment of sorrow, moment of grief, moment of great anguish, what does he do? There is a time and a place to lay one's head upon their pillow, but he prayed. He prayed to his father. And, and was he ready for what came ahead? He was. He was ready. And I would say, I would argue that one of the ways, one of the reasons why he was ready is because he had been praying to his father. This, this is a challenge for me. Uh, I, I'm guessing it's probably a challenge for you too. And again, the encouragement, can we make progress? Can we grow bit by bit in this? I'm not saying take a five foot stride, but a baby step. What do you need to do to grow in praying with other believers? Be steadfast in prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer together. Do you do that? Do I do that? God help us. The Father help us that we would do better at being steadfast in prayer. Father, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your word. Father, I am so grateful that you have made it possible to pray, that you have lined up alongside of me on either side, before and behind fellow believers who I can pray with. Thank you for those who are diligent, who are steadfast in praying with me, that they help me when I am weak. I pray that I help them when they are weak. And may you grow us together in this good discipline. And, and especially, Lord, that when we are in moments of crisis and difficulty and emotional distress, we would not turn to other things first, but we would recognize the need of the moment is going together to our Heavenly Father. Help us in this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your patience with me as we attempted a slightly different way of doing this. We'll see what we can do next week with the screen or with the text on the screen. God bless you. See you next time.